Learning from Canada's uh, immigration ministry today that uh, they are putting new emphasis on attracting graduates uh, from Hong Kong to come to Canada. And while they're doing that, they are also taking the time to uh, reassure and remind Canadians who live in Hong Kong that they can return to Canada at any time. All of this, of course, um, a not so veiled response to uh, the surprising language used by China's uh, ambassador to Canada recently in which he uh, had a, a somewhat veiled threat against Canadians living in Hong Kong. Uh, all of that underscoring how difficult this relationship has become and what a departure from the hope for free trade agreement uh, between our two countries. And it comes at a time, of course, when a new president-elect in the United States does add some new hopes for a change in tone uh, between China and the rest of the world. Leland Miller is the CEO of the China Beige Book. Uh, always great to have you with us, Leland. And I did, I did want to start there with this tone because, you know, Canada's really just been um, whipsawed by what's gone on between uh, China and the U.S. We feel very caught in the middle, but there were very real ramifications for human beings and businesses here. Uh, do you see the relationship getting better? Does a president-elect Biden, a President Biden, make things better for everybody? Well, I do think that one of the things Biden has talked about doing is 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 tightening this relationship that hasn't been as tight the last several years. Uh, there's been aluminum tariffs, which were fairly antagonistic. Uh, there hasn't been anyone obviously speaking up for the Canadians being held uh, in uh, in China, uh, in, mm -hmm. you know, in, in return for for Meng Wanzhou, uh, Huawei CFO. Uh, so there there's there's been a lot of tense. There's been a huge tense relationship between Canada and China, and it hasn't seemed like the United States was was very clearly taking Canada's back. I think that will change. It doesn't mean these problems are going to go away, uh, but it does mean that I think that one of the things that, that Biden is going to do coming right out of the you know right right out in, in, in January February is just is just tightening these relationships and try to send the message that everybody's on the same wavelength in terms of pushing back on China. You know, one of the things that's been somewhat fascinating, if I can put it, it's hard to find the right word to use there, actually, Leland, but um, is to watch China's progression through the pandemic um, on its own, starting in China and emerging first, uh, and its economy seems to be recovering. I want to focus on the uh, first the pandemic with you and whether what we hear is true. Uh, I mean, is, is, is China kind of handling this as much better than the rest of the world as it would appear? Yeah, absolutely. Like China has done a very nice job recovering from the pandemic. I mean, you look at our data, we see month to month improvement. We see quarter to quarter on improvement. You know, the recovery has been better than any other recovery in the world. And of course, they've been using tools that are not available to most other countries in the world. But there's no there's no mistaking the fact that this has been a very impressive containment of the uh, of the coronavirus and a very impressive recovery. You know, where we break with them is the idea that things are back to normal. You know, it's very important from a political standpoint for the Beijing leadership to broadcast the idea that we're already back to where we were a year before. We're already growing on top of that. Look at the great job we've done. That doesn't bear itself out in any of the data. So I think we can pat the Chinese leadership on the bat for the, for for their for their engineering of a uh, solid recovery. But let's just not take it too far. We're not back to normal and, and we may not be for a long time now. Do we, just when we drill into that data uh, based on what you're seeing, um, do we trust it? How much of it is based on stimulus that will have repercussions? I mean, what do you see when you look at the real hard numbers on the ground in China? Well, the biggest thing we've seen is, is that there is no year-on-year -year improvement, like I just said. Um, you know, you're seeing an improvement. Yeah. And it's improving on quarter, but it's not improving on year. The second thing is that you, you are seeing areas of China with with great momentum that are doing very well that are they're borrowing a lot more and spending a lot more and and investing a lot more but this is not what's happening in China writ large if if you separate what's happening on some big cities in the coast usual suspects, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, and you separate what's happening there from what's happening in the rest of the country, you have two very divergent pictures. And what's happening outside of the biggest cities in China and outside of the biggest firms in China is a much more muted recovery. Firms are not borrowing as much. They're not producing as much. They're not consuming as much. They're not earning as much. It's, it's nowhere near the story that's being told on the top line. So we, we have to treat China as more than just this monolithic beast represented by mm. Beijing or Shanghai City. How important is it to the Chinese economy that the rest of the world, and especially, obviously, uh, the American economy, recovers and recovers strongly? It's pretty important. Uh, you know, the, even if 
Beijing was able to engineer a perfect domestic recovery. And keep in mind, what they've done is get factories up and running and, and get the production side growing and, and producing, which, which has been good. But there has been a major lag in, in the consumption sectors, retail, services. You're not seeing domestic demand take off. Uh, what they're doing right now is they're exporting, exporting a lot importing a lot less, that can't be done indefinitely. So if you're going to see a sustained, true economic recovery in China, you're going to have to see a global recovery so that so that this can work, uh, so this could be a lot more uh, two-way. Two uh, right now, China's recovery is fine, but they just can't get all the way back without there being improvement around, around the world. We just saw Ant Group's IPO um, put on hold as it looked as though regulators were taking a closer look at some of the kind of financial regulatory aspects. Does that suggest, uh, A, I guess I wonder what your impression of that, but does it suggest that China is clamping down on the concerns many people have about the shadow banking, about the lack of regulations in parts of the financial services industry there? Yeah, I think the overall message is no one's too big for the party. I mean, Jack Ma, I think, made some very big tactical mistakes in the run-up to the IPO, basically calling bankers out publicly, and, and they didn't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does get to a deeper issue, which is what you identified. Uh, the financial system, uh, everyone's worried about their financial system. The Chinese are at the top of the list. You know, there's a, it's very right. opaque. Uh, they don't understand uh, all the ways the shadow system is intertwined with the regular economy. And so they are worried about financial stability. And they are worried about certain giant firms being so big that they can't fail, but the government may not be able to support them uh, quick enough. So they're trying to eliminate hmm. Financial instability uh, from uh, from the picture. So this is this is a political move, right. and this is also a move about financial stability. Leila Miller, always great to have you with us. Uh, really appreciate your uh, the granularity of your view of the Chinese economy. Leila Miller, CEO of the China Beige Book.